Hi, my name is Jamie Steef. I work with the Tamarack Institute. And today we're gonna to be talking about transformative change. Uh, it depends on your ambition with Karen Perla, Mark Cabage, and Liz Weaver. Uh, as we get started, we, we want to start with um, a land acknowledgement. Uh, I'm joining this call from the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Anishinaabe peoples on the Haldeman Tract, which is colonially known as Waterloo, Ontario. Um, we encourage everybody who is on the call to share where you're joining us from and what you know about the treaties there. Uh, the reason we do this, we see this as, when we think about truth and reconciliation, we see this as an act of truth, just acknowledging where you're from and knowing that reconciliation takes so much more. Um, the photos you see on the screen right now were shared by some of the youth who we are working with our, in our Communities Building Youth Futures team. And uh, we're so thrilled that they're letting us share them. You're joining this call with the Tamarack Institute, which comprises two parts. On one hand, the Learning Center, which uh, you can see the five areas of impact in the wheel up at the right, and also Vibrant Communities, which does work on reducing poverty, deepening community, building youth futures, and addressing climate transitions. Thanks so much, Jamie. And hi, everybody. Really excited to be joining you on this call today. As uh, Jamie mentioned, um, our webinar is Transformative Change. It depends on your ambition. And we're really excited to be joined today by the authors of the paper on uh, called the Ambition, the Ambition Continuum, the Innovation Ambition Continuum, three big words all together. Um, and really happy to be joined by Mark Kabaj and Karen Perla, who are the authors of that paper. And that's really going to be the focus of our conversation today. Um, both have deep experiences facilitating system change um, and impact with communities organize and organizations across the globe. And I'm going to introduce them to you briefly. And one of our first questions in our uh, question and answer session is we're going to ask them to tell us a little bit more about themselves that's really unique. But let me first introduce them to you. So Mark Kabaj is president from Here to There Consulting. Um, and he's an, also an associate of the Tamarack Institute. Mark's current focus is on building the practice of developmental evaluation, integrating real-time feedback and learning in emerging complex and fast-moving environments, and has authored numerous uh, tools and resources on that topic. And I would uh, recommend that you go to Mark's website here to their consulting because there's a wealth of tools and resources on that website. He's involved in social innovation systems and social change projects around Canada and beyond in areas in economic justice, environmental sustainability and human services and food security. So Mark brings a wealth of experience and uh, spent a number of years at Tamarack and is currently a Tamarack associate, as I mentioned. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Karen. Karen Perla is the principal at Perla Inc and is a systems change facilitator who is passionate about helping organizations build the foundations needed to envision and deliver transformation. She has spent 15 years working in the public sector to bring innovative ways of working into a wide array of initiatives by integrating disciplines such as systemic design, strategic foresight, and design thinking. And some of what we're going to be talking about today will weave that experience and that expertise that you have, Karen, into uh, your thinking, your and Mark's thinking about the innovation uh, ambition continuum. She's a co-founder of the Alberta CoLab, the first provincial public sector innovation lab in Canada, and currently directs the Energy Futures Policy Collaborative for the Energy Futures Lab. Karen, is, Karen has also helped pilot training in these approaches with the Northern Alberta Institute of Technology and the University of Alberta. For her work in policy innovation, Karen received the honor of joining the International States of Change Fellowship and um, the ranks of Avenue Magazine's top 40 out of uh, top 40 under 40 
So welcome to both of you um, uh, to the webinar today. And we're going to hear a little bit more about each of you in a minute. But why don't we have you both kind of just say hello to all the folks that are on the call with us. So Mark, over to you. Do you want to say a quick hello? Sure, <clears throat> sure. thanks, Liz uh, and Jamie for hosting this. Hi, everyone. Nice to see a lot of familiar names uh, on the list here. And uh, really happy to be talking about this today. And how about you, Karen? Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to join um, everyone on today's call. And it's just been such a treat to get to know Tamarack a little bit through the work that Mark does and through the work that Liz does. So I'm excited to kind of just get things started. Great. Hey, so we wanted to um, spend a bit of time before we got into the content learning a little bit more about the folks that are in the room. Uh, and so we have a poll question. I'm going to ask Jamie to bring up the poll. The poll actually leans into the three um, kind of stages or phases of the innovation ambition continuum. And so we invite everybody who is um, joining us on the webinar to kind of pick the place that your, your organization or an innovation that is happening at your organization sits. So we'll give folks a couple of minutes to uh, land in a place. You can see there are three options available to you. So the first option is the innovation moved a priority forward, but only had incremental impact or with incremental impact. The second option is the innovation was a reform oriented change, which tried to move systems, but was slower in moving forward than anticipated. And the final option that you have available is the innovation led to, uh, to high impact transformative change. We currently have about 65 people, or 65%, pardon me, responded, 75% okay. now. We'll just try to push it slightly over the 80% range and then we'll share. Okay, we're at 81%. Great. Um, okay, so why don't we end the poll, Jamie, and we'll let uh, Mark and Karen and everybody see where we landed. And maybe Mark, um, you can, uh, comment on what you're seeing, Mark and Karen. Go ahead, Karen. In interesting, but probably not surprising in that we have most pushes in incremental and reform and less in the transformative, but I think that that's what we're going to be trying to encourage in today's conversation, right, Mark? Yeah, I thought yeah. great segue into the chat. Yeah. yeah. It's not like you planned this, right, Liz? No, <laughs> at no, all. No, okay. it's you joined us. It's the it's, uh, <laughs> universe telling us uh, you know, uh, what we need to know today and what we need to share. So thank you everybody for completing the poll. Um, so let's go on to the next slide, Jamie. And our first question is really a question to both of you, Karen and Mark, and maybe we'll start with you, Karen. So what would you, I gave your bio, I shared your bio. Um, what would you like the folks to know who are on the call? Um, something unique about yourself. Maybe nothing unique, but maybe a funny story about how I met Mark. Um, so when the Alberta CoLab actually launched, it launched as a very experimental internal to government consultancy with a very complex uh, change agenda, which meant we needed to get very good at justifying our existence and we need to get good very fast. And so when I was asking around who could help us evaluate this type of work, Mark's name obviously immediately came up. And when we met, I remember him saying something like, Karen, it's probably going to feel like a colonoscopy. It's going to be uncomfortable, but I think we'll all be better for it. And so <laughs> I was like, oh my God, who is this person? <laughs> but my, my introduction to the world of developmental evaluation, and I've been a fan ever since. I just see that as a key piece of systems change. And so always kind of that thinking has been in the mix of this uh, innovation uh, continuum as well. Great. Thanks. Mark, what about you? Oh, it's nice, Karen. Thank you. I was going to say something without planning this, everyone. Uh, nice about... <laughs> Karen and the CoLab. Many of you, if you haven't heard about CoLab, it doesn't exist any longer, does it, Karen? Uh, but it was when I first met Karen and the gang at CoLab, I was so immensely proud that uh, there would be an institution like that in a government agency in general, in particular in Alberta. And so <clears throat> if you want to know more, you can Google CoLab and find uh, a lot of the resources that came out of that terrific institution and the number of people who left that institution doing really good strategic foresight 
uh, and innovation work right now is really impressive. So Karen was a, a huge central part of that. And Karen and I do live in Edmonton, Treaty 6 country. We've been working kind of together since 2015 on different projects, and we even do board games once in a while together. So uh, it feels like we're a, uh, it's a natural team for us to explore this today with you. Great. Thank you both for um, that. Let's move on to question two. And this question is directed at you, Mark. Um, and and maybe, Karen, you could join in with your perspective as well. But really interested in, you know, I know you have a ton of things that you think about and that you explore um, and that are kind of in your line of sight. But what really motivated you to you know, think about the innovation <laughs> ambition continuum and write this paper. And why is this, you know, a particularly useful way of framing it, given the current context that we find ourselves in? Yeah, I, I'll say a couple of things and I know Karen has some thoughts on this as well. So Liz, Liz and I, everyone known each other for quite some time. Uh, I was at Tamarack for the first 10 years when we were doing something called Vibrant Communities, which was uh, like the first iteration of collective impact approaches to reduce poverty. And uh, we've not chatted about this, Liz, but I actually remember us always talking about change. But we, 20 some years ago, we weren't talking a lot about transformative change. We didn't hear that term that often. Of course, we heard it once in a while, but it wasn't used in the same frequency and intensity and almost uh, with the same level of emotion that that we talk about it now. And um, I think, you know, no one's, uh, everyone's quite awake now <laughs> about the realities of living in a very dynamic context uh, where not only is it dynamic, but it's very clear that we, pro we can't live like this anymore. Like the current ways of thinking about the world and how we relate to the world and to each other and the systems we built around us, uh, we, we literally have to change or we won't be here. And so I think the word has come up quite a bit. And Karen and I, because of the work we do together, we know that we, there's groups with who do want change. And we know that the term transformative is thrown around a lot. And we've had several points, uh, I would even say it's hundreds of moments where we've had to ask ourselves, what, what does that mean, transformative mm -hmm. change? And what, what are the different ways of uh, thinking about change? Because uh, uh, we think there's, it's a pretty loaded word. And so what we wanted to do is we, we in fact, Karen, the first time that I ever uh, thought about different levels of change is when you introduced me to the Three Horizons mm -hmm. framework, and you're going to speak more about that shortly. But we each then kind of assembled a bunch of things that had, had pe where people tried to talk about what did change mean, transformative change in general, but also other kinds of change, like incremental and reform. And so we decided to uh, create a little mashup of a, a document that said, here's what we think this means, or here's one way of making sense of this uh, for us. And the reason we think this is important, because if we're in the game of systems change, we we better be clear about some of the distinctions and the different ambitions of change. So we, we thought we are struggling with it. Others are probably struggling with it. If we could write something that helped make sense for ourselves on it, it might be useful to others as well. Yeah, no, um, similar. If I can just jump in, Liz, um, it was kind of like, you know, there's so many tools out there figuring out, giving us a way to think about change. But part of it was like, you know, what if they brought that all together and what's the so what from that kind of mashup um, approach to that? And that's what really sparked my interest in doing this with Mark. I've spent a lot of time working with people and teams um, and helping them think about the future and all the possibilities that that contains. And then thinking through what does this mean for like us today, you know, the choices we need to make, the actions we need to take. And transformative innovation always comes up. But to my mind, there's always been a huge difference between the question of how might we anticipate, plan, or adapt to that type of disruption versus actually trying to create it. And you know, I've spent a lot of time with government and a lot of time in the energy sector. And in that space, we definitely point to transformative change. We'll talk like, oh, look at what Japan's doing on hydrogen. Oh, look at what Amsterdam's doing on the circular economy. But the conversation is more often than not, um, is that going to affect us? And how can we do we need to respond in some way? Um, so it was always kind of like, why, why is that the case? And so part of this was trying to bring together kind of all the pieces that we might need to consider around transformative innovations. What this type of work will ask not just of ourselves, but of our organizations and others in the system. And so I would say this was our attempt to have a constructive starting point for talking about what it's actually going to take to get those moonshots off the ground. Karen, and, um, 
Yeah, you put together a bit of a slide for this. So maybe we could move to the slide and maybe you could- um, I see Mark itching for something. I'm not sure what he's yeah. trying to do though. <laughs> yeah, no, but Liz, actually just the way you described that, Karen and Liz, what's the quote that we, Jay, Jay Connor has introduced just about the movie? Do you mind? Yeah, so he uh, uh, they asked Francis Ford Coppola, who is a director. Some of us may know his work. Some of us may not be as familiar, but he's a director of movies. They asked him- the difference between a good movie and a bad movie and Coppola responded a good movie is when everybody makes the same movie so that's uh yeah been a pretty provocative statement well and that's Karen that it just popped to mind when you shared that what we're trying to do is we all sit at change tables uh we should probably be clear about what kind of movie we're trying to make and mm -hmm. part of that is our level of ambition and so what we're trying to do is create some useful distinctions here based on stuff that already exists and the the, the at least for the sources that informed us we're getting to maybe how the world has changed a lot of people know about that they they introduced some of these ideas then steve waddell did a thing on three orders of change where we use some of the slang, same language Three Horizons framework, which Karen knows extraordinarily well, <laughs> was really uh, important to us. And of course, some of the work that FSG did to popularize or make more accessible some dimension of systems change is useful. And we want to confirm there's a lot of other sources and we're not trying to be a target only a few. We're just acknowledging that there's a multiplicity out there and this is our best way of trying to, to bring some of them together. Great, thank you. And I, I, I think um, this is a good starting list too for folks that are wanting to explore a little bit further. Um, we're gonna go on to our next question and we're gonna spend a bit more time in the next question. I know Karen, you're gonna, um, Karen and Mark, you're gonna both lead us off, but um, there are kind of, we want you to dive into the core of the paper, which is about these three innovation ambition continuums and what can what characteristics that um, that you identify, but also uh, should be in the line of sight of the folks on the call. And um, Karen and Mark, as you're talking, I know you provided some background slides, so just let Jamie know to forward the slides because we have them in the deck. So. Uh, who should I turn it over to first? Um, Karen? Perfect. Yeah, I'll tag team this. I'll start off by going over the, like the bones of the framework, and then I'll hand it off to Mark to talk about the implications. So I think if you can go to the next slide, <clears throat> we'll start there. So, um, you know, the intent of using an x-axis to represent the degree of change and a y-axis to represent ambition is basically just to say that transformative innovation is truly a high stakes place. Um, and, you know, as I'll try to explain, change makers doing this type of work, in fact, I do believe see the world very differently and are actually fundamentally playing a different game than most of us out there. And I like to use the metaphor of games, um, you know, not just because Mark and I like to play board games, <laughs> which I think is fun, but I think it, you know, the game metaphor captures the sense that we need to understand why we think the choices that we're making will help us succeed. Um, so I like to think of each type of innovation as more or less relevant, depending on how you see the game that we can play and actually need to play right now. So for example, incremental innovations are actually quite impactful, especially if the situation as you see it feels pretty stable and intractable. It's a business as usual situation. Um, the stakes are well known, the rules are well known around how things work and um, probably very little will actually affect that. So innovating in this space is often really around continuous improvement. You want to improve on what we're really good at, what we're doing, what already exists. We just want to do it better, faster, and cheaper. Um, so again, this is really around tweaking aspects of the system, you know, like policies, relationships, even resource flows. Um, I like to think of uh, incremental innovations as those quick wins that can ideally improve a situation and get us moving in the right direction, but they're not anything that's going to fundamentally rock the boat. Um, a good example is plastics. Like for years in Canada, we've had some sort of recycling program to deal with the waste problem. An innovation that came in that really kind of tweaked resource flows while trying to nudge kind of behaviors um, was when they started to pay people five cents to return their bottles. Um, trying to nudge more participating in recycling, participation in recycling, but people still use and throw away their plastic and glass bottles. So, you know, at some point, however, this situation, business as usual is no longer fit for purpose. And while incremental change is still quite effective, uh, perhaps maybe it's no longer enough, right? So reform, so change makers um, that see the situation in this way, that the situation is starting to change, 
might consider innovations that are much more reform oriented in nature. And these types of innovations are very much clearly a change. They aren't just a tweak anymore. Um, for most change makers, these innovations may see you push into adjacent areas of work, of expertise or services, or perhaps they might manifest as a very different shift in how you approach a challenge. So one example that we highlighted in the actual framework itself is the coalition of leaders who came together in 2010 to reform New York's uh, juvenile offender system. The reform, uh, they reformed multiple aspects of the system, including changing the criminal age of responsibility from 16 to 18, all of which uh, resulted in a number of improved uh, areas of performance. And while absolutely impactful, these reforms also tend to be about fixing obvious things, obvious shortcomings of business as usual. Um, they are the status quo. So this type of innovation doesn't necessarily drive the fundamental change in what you might call like the root causes of a problem. You know, the mindsets, the values, the worldviews underpinning juvenile delinquency. Um, it's a great example, if I were to carry the game metaphor forward, of an effort where the game and the goal is still basically the same, like we're trying to address juvenile delinquency, but winning basically means playing by a new set of rules. And so the beauty of that example is that the innovators, in fact, actually worked to design and shape a new set of rules by which we could improve performance in the situation. Um, it's important to note that when we're talking about reform oriented innovation, even if, you know, trying to lift this up and land this type of innovation isn't, even if it's not full on transformative, it's still very much a tough grind. Um, even though people will likely see this as a good idea, you know, you'll generally have good support to do this type of work. The system and people in it may still resist it for a number of reasons, and we've outlined a number of those, but they include the fact that big systems are complex. You know, they've got a lot of inertia, which means they're hard to untangle. Reforms can threaten the power and legitimacy of uh, certain key actors, so pushback is not often surprising. And the consequences of reforms aren't always fully known, especially when we think about the long-term impacts, so people tend to be, to be cautious around moving forward with some of these ideas. So finally, going back to the game's metaphor, um, innovators putting forth, pushing for transformative innovations are really saying that what we actually need is a need to play a new game um, designed by a, new set, a totally new set of rules. And this is because uh, transformative innovations are really introducing very radical ideas that represent an alternative system, a different system underpinned by different worldviews, new values, new narratives, very different from those that hold the system in place today. And when systems are rigid, these kind of moonshots, these radical ideas are often relegated to solutions in waiting, which at minimum can actually make the vision of change much more tangible. Um, so timing often is a big factor when we think about transformative innovation. Um, when systems are in a phase of transition, for example, um, AKA like experiencing a series of shocks or you know we're in an acknowledged crisis situation, then the potential for transformation uh, significantly increases. Um, the example we reference in the framework is the Mincom experiment, you know, launched in Manitoba in the late 1970s. And we talk about how 40 years later in the COVID pandemic, all of a sudden this basic scheme gained fresh relevance, right? It was at the center of a number of discussions talking about the merits of introducing basic income at a larger scale. So the example really highlights that transformative innovations aren't good bets, like, you know, the reform innovations are. They're more big bets. They're big gambles. Um, they're high risk, high reward situations um, where most of these kind of innovations, these ideas are destined to stay in the idea zone. That said, these types of innovations are really critical for provoking rigid systems and for helping the system move closer to tipping points of change um, that we need to see going forward. So if I can get the next slide. And so to be fair, to be clear, like the difference between incremental reform oriented and transformation, like the more that Mark and I talk, like the lines are actually quite blurry. Um, at the end of the day, um, whether you're improving or addressing significant shortcomings or introducing radically new ideas. Um, so just to get down to the brass tacks of what we were looking at, we also thought, you know, there may be five aspects of change that change makers want to consider to figure out what it is that we're trying to lift up. So um, they are impact, you know, the extent to which an innovation can make a positive difference on a complex social challenge. Feasibility, the extent to which an innovation can be implemented within existing capabilities, or do we require new development of new skills? Viability, the extent to which an innovation can be supported by larger system institutions, policies, and power structures. 
risk, the, the extent to which an innovation is likely to experience innovation failure or have unintended consequences, real or perceived, and resistance, the extent to which us system actors are likely to embrace an innovation. And we mapped it out this way in this chart, basically, you know, to show that feasibility and viability don't necessarily always equate to the impact, the desired impact that you want. Um, it'll take probably more than a single strategy planning session um, to go from uh, somewhat an actor or an organization that's in the space of continuous improvement to a game changer status. And at the same time, all of these different games, the way I've described them, have an important role to play in systems change, right? And so they all have value for different purposes. Mark, I tried to do that under five minutes. <laughs> so that was like really hard. <laughs> No, I thank thank you, uh, Karen, for again doing a real nice job of synthesis. So I would have nothing to add except some implications coming up. But maybe Liz, uh, maybe you might have some reflections on this way of framing degrees of change. Yeah, you know, it reminds me, Mark, of uh, a phrase that I attribute to you a lot. Um, although I know it probably comes from other places, where you talk about small bets before big bets, right? Mm -hmm. And so often um, when we're putting funding applications together, we think about the big bet or we try to push the big bet, um, that transformative innovation. But in fact, uh, we often stop at incremental or even reform oriented. And so for me, this is kind of thinking about, you know, what is our, what is our ambition, but also to give legitimacy to the different types of innovation, right? To say that incremental is valid because, you know, feasibility and viability are much higher and impact can be predictable, right? Um, so it's not that it's not a good strategy or not a good way of innovating. It might be completely appropriate for the type of thing that we're trying to innovate. And if I were to look across collective impact efforts as I see them unfold in the world, they often start with incremental innovation then they start to look at the policy domain and think about the policy innovations that can happen. And then they move on to that transformative population base. Although I'm not sure that they completely change the rules. I think they sometimes get to transformation uh, with the existing rules or bringing in some new people, some new actors into the play. But yeah, so, so I find this framing to be really interesting and helpful. Well, you've kind of also signaled some of the implications of just trying to understand the world through this lens. And uh, I maybe just a shorthand, a note, uh, when we were doing this, I was reminded of a, <clears throat> an experience I had with a kid when Karen, we were trying to say, what, what are examples of transformative change? And when I was a little kid in night, like in the early 1970s, I grew up in a small rural town outside of Edmonton. And I remember asking someone <clears throat> in town how far it was to Edmonton. And it was about 200 kilometers. That's the, the real answer, 212 kilometers. Uh, but I remember someone saying, it's about six beers. <laughs> and so, and that, that was referenced. And when I was a kid, people drove. People dra drove with drinks between their legs and would have a rye and coke. It's, it was very kind of prairie oriented rural culture. And you might still see that now, but you wouldn't see that now. There, there has been a transformation in paradigm that has reflected itself in a whole bunch of systems and policies and practice, but that uh, transformative change, you know it when you see it, it's a qualitative shift. And the problem is it's easier to see in retrospect than it is in advance. Mm -hmm. And so Karen noted, what we're really trying to do is create tipping points, as many tipping points as we can to see the transformative things emerge. But there is some, there the lines are blurry, as you mentioned, Karen, but sometimes they're not blurry. It's clear mm -hmm. when something has transformed or not. So Karen set it up nicely. Uh, I'm just going to review a couple of the implications of this. And Karen, I think you and I are saying, here's just some opening ideas we had about mm -hmm. implications, because you and I have already started thinking about more implications than the ones we presented. But we've got three to show you, Liz, if we go to the next slide and Jamie, and just with a couple of questions around each. Yeah, I think we have to go one more slide because you anticipated my question about implications. Um, so let's go to this one, perfect. Well, so well, implication and then some questions. So uh, we should, to, to your quote, Liz, we should talk about, are we making the same movie? 
right? Uh, are we ready for the reality that Karen says, if we want transformation to say, we know this is, the why of transformation is clear, but the how is not. It's very, dis it's very difficult to disrupt systems, to show alternatives. Uh, they really are moonshots. Uh, uh, in fact, I'll go even one step further. Uh, I have seen some transformative pilot projects that really are based on a completely different worldview and are quite coherent and compelling, but they are so far ahead of the ecosystem that their chances of being sustained, never mind scaled, are quite low. So then you'd say, well, what does success look like? Well, maybe it is demonstrating a viable alternative. And as Karen noted, waiting for the day that it'll show up. But but that, you know, what can we reasonably expect around winning from different change mm -hmm. ambitions? So uh, are we all clear about that? Do we know what kind of efforts it, it's going to take? Do we know that some things going to be more feasible than the other? And uh, this is really, Karen, a point that Karen makes quite often. Are, are we... Uh, sometimes external transformation of change requires internal transformation of the innovators and the change organization. So we might be saying we want the external world to change, and it does. And then in order for that to happen, we have to change as well. So this is mostly saying, are you clear about what you're signing up for? Number one. So implication number one. Karen, do you want to riff on this at all? Just to share, because like part of what I've been thinking about it a lot has been, you know, that question around <clears throat> all of these games are good. You know, we need to actually get good at all of them, you know, incremental reform oriented transformational, but the subtext is like we want to move people more into that we need more of that transformational change, because the moment is asking for it. But how if how do we actually go from X if we're here, we're really good at improving systems we're in the incremental space. How, what do we actually, what will it take to get us to Y to that transformational yeah. space right. What would it take to think and act in a way that pushes for transformation, you know, and what are the conditions that need to be right. For change makers to feel that they can go there um, exactly. because I mean we talk a lot about well we need more money we need more visionary leadership and while those things are important they're not necessarily sufficient when you look at all the five characteristics that we, we at least thought were relevant to this kind of conversation exactly. so I mean I'm, I'm noodling on that a lot lately. Yeah. Well, I wonder um I wonder Mark if this is you know you you referred to your early days at Tamrac and the Vibrant Communities uh, Ending Poverty Initiative. And I wonder if um, an element of transformation was the push by Tamarack to include the voice of people with lived and living experience in the conversation. And when I think back to the early days, that was that was um, difficult for those early adopters of um, the ending poverty work to um, really authentically engage and um, center in the leadership of people with lived and living experience. Now that has shifted over time, mm -hmm. but that was an innovation, a kind of a foundational innovation that Tamarack held very strongly to. Uh, absolutely. It also uh, reveals everyone, I think everyone knows this, that systems well karen you said it it requires multiple things to happen not just one so mm -hmm. liz absolutely meaningful central role of voices of experience is part of the change process but we also know that collective impact as an approach has quite rightly been accused of sometimes simply being more conservation oriented can we better manage the system we had when when a lot of the critiques and i forgot the names of them but they came out about six years ago were to say it's too conservative it's too incrementally oriented we want transformation not conservation reminds us of the phrase that we found in that one article we wrote uh liz often man they, they refer to managers but maybe it's people people would often rather live with a, a problem they can't solve than a solution they don't control so to your point about inner, it's not just organization, is it, Karen? It's about us. Like we're, mm -hmm. we all want swing for the fence, but it's nerve wracking. There's a lot of unpredictability and transformative change. Yeah, once you leave that incremental space. <laughs> it's a different zone. And you're it's gonna talk zone. a bit more about that. Oh, yeah. So that's a big one. It, to your point, Liz, are we making the same movie? Number one, maybe we'll go to the next slide. Uh, number two is if we're making the same movie, what does strategic look like? And Karen has done a lot of the, the thinking here. Uh, it means you have to pay attention to your context. Like what is strategic in your context if you're trying to do food security or, or uh, income security renewal in Ontario? I see Jamie made a really good reference there to transformative. What does that look like there? If you're doing energy transition in Alberta, if you're 
uh, indigenous communities with the sovereignty orientation to child care and are uh, assuming responsibility for a broken child care system. What does it look like there? So you have to be really culturally responsive. Number one, you have to pay attention to everything else that's going around you, right? It's not what do we need to do, it's what's going on and what needs to be done. And then you, how do you, you and your allies make a unique contribution to what's going on? So it really says, don't, don't go with your preferred solution. What's your context? What else is going on? And where can you add crazy value in that change process? So it's really, it's quite demanding, really. You, you have to have lateral vision. If you're changing a context, pay attention to that context. Uh, I don't think this one's counterintuitive at all. Um, maybe we'll go to the, the third one. And uh, this one is quite interesting. I'm gonna say a little bit and then Karen, uh, we've, you've been uh, thinking a lot about this and there's a lot more stuff coming out about thinking if we're changed people thinking about portfolios of innovations. And so the idea is uh, don't just make one bet. You talked about small bets before big bet. There's nothing worse than one idea when it's the only one you have. Uh, so, uh, or more dangerous than one idea. So Karen, I'll let you riff a little bit on this, but. Uh, are there a couple of uh, opening moves that you want to use <laughs> on a transformative change initiative? Where do they lie in the continuum? And uh, in some cases, and I think you implied this, both of you, Liz and Karen, sometimes you sequence innovations in a particular way to get bigger impact. You might start with a smaller one in order to get a big one. You might even push for a big one to freak people out and get them disruptively oriented and then shrink the change and saying, well, let's start with an incremental reform one, but knowing we're still going to pursue transformative ones. So there's a lot of issue about portfolio and sequencing. Karen, riff on this because you've done a lot more thinking about it than I have. Uh, <clears throat> I think that is debatable, but I do think there's something around like the risks of portfolios is that people will lean into the incremental because they know that like the portfolio will be there, right? But they'll do the easy stuff first because that's doable. So it's kind of like how do you situate a portfolio? So it's not like incremental first, then reform, then transformative. How can you kind of like chew and walk gum to you know, chew and walk? No, what's the same? I'm bad at these folks. He's saying chew, walk and chew gum at the same time. Yeah. There. <laughs> yeah. So how can you do like as an organization or as a change effort, how can you have hands in all those different types of games at the same time, I think is where the like the, the, the I guess the challenge for the thinking comes in a little bit to my mind. And then there's been a lot of interesting conversation around like what defines an opening move for you. Um, we've been doing a lot of that around energy transition in some other projects that I've been leading. And so part of it is like an opening move, maybe something that actually signals that this is the this is, you are interested in change, like you are committed to change, it has to be able to signal that to different audiences. It might be something that helps to reframe, uh, you know, a tension point in the conversation that you see as critical, and it might give people certainty that this isn't just a one off change in the system that's going to go away in two years, it's going to actually kind of create stability. So defining criteria around what, if you have 20 ideas, and you could only do five, what would those five be? I think is a really interesting conversation around portfolios. Yeah. So thanks for elaborating on that, uh, Karen. Liz, uh, three implications with questions for each, meaning the answers to those questions, people have to wrestle with on their own and they might have other implications on the questions, but we do think there are consequences to thinking about three horizons and here's at least three clusters of them. I think this is really helpful in terms of, uh, yeah, having a portfolio approach and really thinking about, you know, who's at the table. How, uh, the one thing that this wrote, uh, the kind of the question that rose for me, uh, Mark and Karen, is when you think about um, the innovation curve, and Mark, you often refer to that, right, the pig and the python, you know, what to what degree, um, there's the work of innovation and then there are the innovators, right? So to what degree do those two weave together? Oh, interesting. Karen, you, you, the innovation curve? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I hadn't thought of that one, Liz. Well, maybe I'll let you noodle on it. No, I, I actually, if you don't good. mind, I yeah. There is a potential weaving together because when we think about the innovation curve, you know, often uh, organizations focus on the people at the end, 
right. um, the Ligerts or the Never Adopters. And I think, you know, even when you think about an innovation ambition uh, continuum, the degree to which innovators drive it, but how do they bring in others so that it's not just the innovators as the drivers? That's another That's good implication. Bit, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we, we had a little bit of a conversation around um, almost like trying to create policy change and how it's almost like inside outside baseball sometimes, right? Like um, you're trying to influence these laggards, <laughs> quote unquote, by trying to bring a bigger conversation or trying to drive different, uh, innovation external externally to like a government conversation, right? So there's you're almost playing two sides, two strategies, you know, at the same time. So yeah, I think it's interesting to think about like on that innovation curve, the different strategies you would employ depending on who, what, how you're targeting and who you want to bring along in that innovation. Yeah. Yeah, it really speaks to this portfolio approach that um, both of you talked about. Um, let's move on to our next question. Um, uh, Jamie, if we could go to the next slide. Um, so there's uh, implications here, right? There's implications for funders, there's implications for folks that are around collaborative tables, there are implications for innovators, as I just identified. So what what are the what's advice that you would have for um, different uh, different groups of folks? or individuals or actors? I think you're first, Karen, on this one. Oh, OK. Um, yeah. So I mean, like, yeah, I think uh, a lot of what we were thinking about was actually already raised in the conversation. But I do have one additional implication that I've been thinking of, and I think it's an important one. And you know, I apologize, as I'm still you know, working out how I frame actually frame this. But to my mind, in some ways, the days of simple change, simple fixes, fixes are gone. <laughs> like it's not the 1960s anymore. Um, that's something my mom would say. But like complexity and uncertainty aren't just the reality for visionaries or folks in the transformational change space. Um, and so, like Mark said, at the you know once you leave that incremental space, which is a space of greater certainty than reform or transformation efforts, the work becomes highly emergent and iterative. And to succeed, you have to become highly adaptive and agile. Um, and so to my mind, there's no useful roadmaps right now for how to navigate this. And this desire for roadmaps, which you'll get a lot from, from funders, from decision makers, et cetera, I think that's actually almost a dangerous thing, you know, because the roadmaps represent change as if it's linear and consequential. So part of me is like, how do we need to think, be thinking about the work that we do? And how do we need to be funding this type of work that's not linear, that's not consequential? And how do we operationalize this but as a collective, you know, like as a sector? Because it's not going to be just one change maker that's going to get this across the finish line. So it's not a simple piece of advice, but I do think we need to think about like the emergent adaptive space and what that means operationally. Yeah. Mark? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I know we want to get to questions, so I'll be brief. Thanks, Karen. That's a, that's the big one. That's the culture shift that we need to make in terms of how we make change. Uh, I would say uh, I think it's also important to think about the uh, two things. Uh, we all want change, but we're but we struggle with the dynamics of transition. So you know, when you move from one house to the other, that's a change. But how do you get ready to move to the new house? And you know the logistics of that, and I think we don't really understand transition dynamics, and we get frustrated when things don't change overnight. So I think there's you know the Giel's framework, and there's other frameworks that talk about transition. I think we have to get better at transition stewardship, not even management, but curating transitions. And it's happening all the time now. It's not as if it doesn't happen naturally, but can we embrace the idea of transition? And number two, I think we uh, I think we should better understand the inevitable dynamics of resistance to change. And uh, I think we all know that, but I actually find we are quite narrow in our thinking about why there's resistance. And there's a lot of very good analysis around power and this uh, assumption that systems don't change because those in power are holding on greedily to it and don't want to let it go. And I think that's central. So I'm, uh, I know I'm going to get some flack for this. I think that that is a central challenge in all change power and those incumbents who don't want to let go. But I, when, when Karen describes some of the changes that she did earlier, a lot of it is just inertia, fear of uncertainty, being overwhelmed. And I'd like us to have a broader understanding of resistance that includes power, but is much more than power. 
because uh, we diminish our ability to curate transition process a bit by just concluding it's only a power game. Some have it, some don't, and those who have it don't want to give it up. It's that, but it's way more. So I think those two things are implications that I'm thinking about quite a bit, but I, I think they're as a couple of Karen's emphasis on being more adaptive, uh, really important. So thanks, thank you both. Um, this has been really great. And you really walked us through not only your current, the current thinking that frames a paper, but now some of your more recent thinking and implications around um, uh, really getting to transformative innovation, but also thinking about, you know, uh, reform and incremental innovation as well. We are going to move to the opening of the questions from the folks. And I can see that we have one question in the chat box. Um, so Jamie, we're going to jump over uh, this slide and go right to questions and maybe have you bring the question forward um, for Mark and Karen. Sure, thank you so much. Um, our first question is from David Plouffe, and he asks, can numerous incremental or reform innovations equal transformation change? <laughs> I have a thought about it, but Karen, do you, if you if you have an, uh, a, a sense of this one, go ahead. I know I have- I'm curious, I, yeah, I wanna hear your opinion, then I might recall that. I like the, David, I like the entire sentence, but I would change one word. I don't think it equals transformative change. I think it creates building blocks. Mm -hmm. It can create building blocks for change because sometimes you do need to accumulate a whole bunch of create momentum and di directionally correct innovation and then hope that you have transformative moments. But I think we uh, happy to be wrong about this, but I, I think I've been in lot, involved in lots of incremental and reform oriented innovations that were good but they did not equal transformation. They didn't change the game <clears throat> under which everyday politics and life is played. Yeah, I, I, I agree with Mark. I think there's something interesting around, they can, at some point, they shed the light on the fact that they are not enough. You know, like you create the window for the need for transformational change because you can put, keep reforming, 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 and you're still not moving the needle to the degree that you want. And I think that that's kind of the, the pressure cooker that kind of a lot of incremental and a lot of reform can create for the system. Yeah. That is great. Oh, Liz, Liz did you have anything to add to that? <laughs> I, know, I was, I was going to say uh, thanks for the answers and see, Jamie, if you had any more questions or any more observations appear in the chat. So I see we have two other questions. And thank you, everybody, who's been using the Q&A box. Um, our next question is from Mickey Stricker Talbot, who asks, I'm curious about the role of imagination and change and how it shows up differently within different types of change. So the role of imagination. Any thoughts? Go ahead, Karen. I mean, <clears throat> I could talk for hours on this from a number of different perspectives. I do a lot of work in futures. So part of it is imagining what the future could look like. You know, and so so it's huge, right? And part of it is like showing that these futures that seem totally like wild cards aren't as wild as you think they are, right? And either we adapt to that or we kind of like get ahead of the game and create the future that we want. So a future like imagination is huge when we think about like what is that transformation that we want to create, but it's also huge when we think about empathy you know, and trying to put ourselves in the shoes of other people and what they're experiencing and trying to design for, for the margins, for people, for needs, et cetera. And so <clears throat> that's kind of, I think, a part of the game changer when you think about like policy and how it has it happened in the past where um, we're designing for people, not with people, right? And like empathy plays a huge part in that. And that's a lot of imagination, getting yourself out of your comfort zone. So two sides. I think where imagination is used again is like futures and kind of like that human-centered perspective that sometimes we lack in, in our innovations. Great answer. Karen's the one to answer that. And uh, hi, Mickey. Uh, I don't know if you know Jeff Mulgan, who used to run Nesta uh, in the United Kingdom, an innovation platform. And Jeff left and he just finished. To, uh, Jeff is kind of a prophet in many ways. Like he's a pretty good 
thinker about what's coming. And he just finished a book called Another World is Possible, How to Reignite Social and Political Imagination. And so uh, I, I, I think it's central. It's very hard. It's very e easy to reproduce narratives and stories. It's very hard to create new ones. That's great. Thank you, Mark. Um, we have a couple more that are coming in through the chat as well. I'll do the last one I see here. Um, one of our one of our participants has asked, how would you best position with partners the value of going beyond incremental change to transformational change? So it sounds like we're making the case, particularly with larger organizations who are busy and involved in many networks and committees. Um, can maybe I'll say something really quick. Uh, I know I'm going to talk about it like an evaluator. When people um, uh, get frustrated with something that's not working out, uh, I like to make the distinction between the why problem of something working out versus the how problem. So I think the case for transformative change in certain areas is just obvious. You know, I mean, if someone doesn't understand the case for change on on some things, that that is its own kettle of fish and you have to work on the case but why questions are different than how questions the why we need to transform many of our systems is clear we're just not good at how and so if we fail at how or we struggle with how or we're scared of how and i am you know uh, and i often don't even have as much skin in the game as other people but i'm scared of it uh the why is clear uh that we're gonna have a lot of how problems but if we fail and it doesn't work and we don't get we, we what we want uh that's not a why problem the why is not going away. We may not be here in, you know, in a generation or two. With clearly the way we run many of our systems are just they're they're gone, they're done. We they can't be done that way. So I like trying to make partly the distinction between the why challenge and the how challenge in change making and saying we're all scared, but the only way we're going to do this is to to you know keep trying and get better at it and improve the chances of maybe. I'm gonna provide a very imperfect answer, but you know, for me, what has worked in the past is really getting down into the implications of the drivers for change. So, um, for example, in the energy sector, the drivers are now investment, you know, and those are very complex and they're asking for significant change in how we develop our energy and our resources. And so one policy change isn't going to get us there anymore. You know, like one new project isn't going to make make that work. So it's kind of like getting people to be okay with embracing the complexity of the situation and then showing them that people are already moving in that direction um, has been kind of an effective piece that I've used in the past. Can, can you know, given you said that, Liz, can I mention just one last thing? Yeah, there's a very good book that I raised in another workshop. It's called, oh, it's upstairs. It's called something like Rock the Boat, uh, making change without rocking the boat. And it, uh, they use the phrase tempered radicals. Yeah, I read that. <laughs> really? Yeah, so it's very good. It's got a lot of very good case studies. And I see someone is asking for cases of transformative change. Uh, surely, sorry, uh, we may not be able to get to it. But in, in that book, they have a lot of examples of change. And what they say is you actually have a lot of agency in a lot of moments. And there's different ways to make acts that contribute to the direction of change because we may never see the tipping points. Um, so there's something there about being a tempered radical and multiple points of influence over the time. It's the accumulation of many things over time. So the question is, what can you contribute with your zone of influence at this moment in history? That's your contribution to change. Mm -hmm. And so maybe some people get overwhelmed with transformation. You're not responsible for transformation. You're responsible for contributing to it. I think uh, that's a really good uh, note to end on, uh, that kind of call to action that uh, I hear you making, Mark. Um, I know we only have about five more minutes uh, left in the webinar today, and I just want to do a couple of wrap-up um, things. First, I want to begin by thanking uh, Jamie for her technical support today uh, with this webinar. You made things run pretty smoothly, Jamie. And also Karen and Mark, um, I found this to be a really uh, interesting, um, challenging and uh, somewhat ambitious <laughs> conversation. And I do think, you know, clarity is really critical in the work that we do, right? Clarity around um, innovation, levels of innovation, 
um, our innovation ambition continuum. And I think what you've been able to do in terms of your thinking, both in writing the paper and continuing to uh, move it forward is create um, maybe clarity, but also questions, right? That kind of combination. Because sometimes when it's clear, it becomes a little bit more uh, opaque um, uh, for us. So thank you so much, both of you, for those really wonderful contributions. Um, so uh, Jamie, if we could go to the next slide, we're going to tell you a little bit more about what's happening at Tamarack. We've got a couple of really um, great workshops that are coming up. Um, there is going to be a big gathering. Those of you that are interested in the climate space, Tamarack has entered into um, the climate space, but from a community-based perspective. And so we're going we're inviting folks to um, join us at this conference, Communities Taking Action on Climate, um, Placing Equity at the Center. Again, really focusing on the role of citizens in this work and the, to make that kind of uh, innovative, uh, ambitious, transformative change. Um, the second uh, area is around uh, asset-based community development. We have a three-hour workshop that's coming up, three and a half hour workshop that's coming up in November. Both of these events are in November and you can go to the Tamarack website and find out more about them. Um, and then finally, we have a, a bunch of really interesting webinars coming up as well. Um, uh, that you can, if you go to the events section on our uh, website, you can learn more about them or these online courses. And so we invite you all to continue learning with Tamarack. And if there are topics or areas that you would like us to explore further, please do send us emails at tamarack at tamarackcommunity.ca. We'd love to hear from you and love to bring forward um, more thinking in this area from Karen and Mark or other um, areas that you might be interested in. In a few days, you're gonna receive a follow-up email, which will include a link to the um, audio from the call today, from the webinar today. Um, please uh, listen to it again or share it with your colleagues. There will also be some resources in that follow-up email and uh, Karen and Mark, if there's anything you wanna add, just please let us know. Um, and again, to learn more about upcoming Tamarack learning opportunities, including workshops and webinars like this one, visit our website, www. I don't even know if you have to do that anymore. Uh, tamarackcommunity.ca, Tamarack community, all one word. Um, and we look forward to having you join us in the future, everybody. Thanks again, Mark and Karen, for this really thought-provoking um, hour that we have spent together. Thanks, guys. Thank you. You're welcome. It was awesome. Yeah, enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah. Everyone.